Hi, my name is Jessica Nicholson. So my life before Jesus was a little bit messy. I'd say a lot of bit messy. My life before Jesus was uh, a lot of anxiety. Uh, my mom helped me out a lot when I was younger. Um, so I really didn't have to like work as hard as some people or have a job like others. I mean, I had to work, but not as hard as others to have what I had. Um, I've been at the church, or a church anyway, on and off since I was a kid. Um, so, I mean, I kind of knew Jesus, but especially through like my teenage, young adult years, anything to do with Jesus, I turned the other way and kind of ran from him. It led to me drinking and partying and uh, doing a, little, a lot of bad things, I guess. I took matters always into my own hands. Like, that's just how I wanted it to be. My way or the highway. Basically. So we were having like financial struggles at the time. Um, and I also was just having troubles being pregnant. <laughs> I was six months pregnant with Onyx. And so, um, and dealing with a toddler and everything was just getting to me all at once. And I just, it was so random. I just saw the church of Estrella. It just popped up on there and I was like, would you like a prayer request? And I was like, yes, actually, I think I want to do that. <laughs> and so I put in a prayer request for our finances and um, also just, again, a healthy pregnancy and healthy labor and... It was the moment, I guess, that I went home that day after they did the prayer group for us and Jessica told me that uh, she found a church online and a lady named Judy and Judy was going to pray for us and she had actually invited us to come to church that weekend. Told the kids and the kids were just like, we should go. And then he was like, yeah, we're going to go. we got to go. And that's what pushed us. <laughs> I think that kind of blew her mind too when I told her that because she wasn't expecting me yeah, to no. say that we would we, we, we would definitely go. When we finally met everyone, it was awesome and everyone was so sweet and Judy really just helped me like overcome my nervousness with all of it too because I was so nervous. I'm not like a dresser up kind of person and she was like, it's just a blue jeans and a t-shirt kind of church, you know, don't feel nervous to come in. And I walked in that day and I was like, nobody else looks like me. I have a nose piercing, I have tattoos, and then the next thing you see is Alex come walking in, and here he is with his tattoos, big guy, and I was like, all right, if he's here and everybody loves him, they're gonna love me. When we decided to get baptized, I think it was kind of funny because I brought it up to Jessica, and she actually <laughs> already had the same thought too at that time, was that we wanted to be baptized. Um, and I think it all played out at a really good time because we got baptized in November, November 7th, and my mom passed away on November 6th, four years prior to that. And when my mom passed away, that was another point in my life that I got pushed away from Jesus. Because I kind of thought, why would, if Jesus was real, why would he take the one and only person that I really had in my life? Because I never had a dad. I only had my mom and my sister. So she kind of got yanked out of my life. And uh, that was really hard on me. And I liked that I got baptized the day after her passing because I felt like it was everything is going to be okay, you know, and you can trust in me, like Jesus told me that, I feel like more, you can trust in me now, and I can help make your life what it should be, and what it could have been the whole time if I would have just started a little sooner, and I think it's okay that we started a little later, because we got to start in a really, really good church. Yes, we found our church. <laughs> So good, so good. Well, hey, I'm so glad you guys are here today. We are in week five of our series called um, The Day I Met Jesus. And we have uh, heard some awesome stories, stories like this. And they mentioned uh, Alex Tovar, which we heard their stories a couple weeks ago. We've had some other great ones. Um, man, if you've missed any of those testimonies, and we filmed some extras that aren't going to make it in, into the room. They're all out on YouTube, and they're underneath a section called Testimonies uh, for our church. And so you can go see them, and there's actually full-length versions. So we've trimmed these down um, for in the room, but there's some longer versions of them out there. So if you want to go watch those, let me just encourage you to, to go do that. They're all so, so good. Well, today we're going to be uh, in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 27. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up there, or if you've got a phone, open up the Bible app. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 27, and while you're flipping there, let me just pray for us to open us up this morning. Father, um, I am so thankful for stories, um, stories like Josh and, and Jessica, that, uh, that somebody reached out to them, that they were proactive in, in following 
what it means to be a Jesus follower. And God, that we see the, the fruit of that now on the other side. Pray this morning that uh, as we look at this passage, God, that it, would, um, that it would not be something that we're just passive about, but God, that we would um, see it as something that we're supposed to be taking steps in, in our faith on, that we're supposed to be proactive in doing the next thing. God, I just pray this morning that you would give us clarity and help us to be more like Jesus when we leave than when we came. In your name, amen. All right, how many of you grew up Catholic? Anybody in the room? Man, so I'm always surprised when I ask this question in our room. So many of you grew up Catholic. Well, I did not grow up Catholic, but um, I, I knew a bunch of you did, so some of you are going to have to help me out with this because we didn't have this growing up Baptist. Um, but the Roman Catholic Church, you guys have and recite something called the Apostles' Creed, right? Uh, some of you are nodding. You're like, oh, yeah. So I, I'm going to put it up on the screen, so just forgive me if I, if I say something wrong. But it goes like this. It says, I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified, died, and was buried. I'm going to pause right there. I read a story about a young boy that was asked to draw a picture about his faith family. And so he took a, a little bit of time, and he drew it, and at the end, um, he presented it to his teacher. And when he did, he presented this picture of an airplane with some people on it. And the teacher looked at it for just a second, and she began to sort of understand what this child had conceptualized. And she said, oh, I see what you've drawn. You've drawn um, Mary and, and Joseph and the baby Jesus. And then she said, but who is the fourth person in the plane? And the little boy said, oh, that's easy. That's Pontius, the pilot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it is interesting to me that in the Apostles' Creed, we have three names that are mentioned. You have Jesus, you have Mary, and then you have the villain, Pontius Pilate, mentioned. His name runs through all of history. In fact, Pontius Pilate shows up 54 times in the New Testament. Four of those are outside of the Gospels. And in each of those four times that are outside of the Gospel, it reads much like the Apostles' Creed, where it says that Jesus suffered and died at the hands of Pontius Pilate and the Pharisees and the Jews who crucified him. But all the others, we have these sort of this moment in all four Gospels where Jesus stands before Pilate. He's there. In fact, most of them have almost an entire chapter dedicated to that, which in the book of Mark is huge. There's only 16 chapters in the book of Mark. And so he gives almost an entire chapter to the conversation between Pilate and Jesus. So you can find John chapter 18, verses 28 through John 19, 16. And John is great. He has, this, he has one of the greatest lines that Pontius Pilate ever says where Pontius and Jesus are talking and Pontius Pilate says to him, he says, hey, listen, what is truth anyways? And I don't know if he was really serious about that question or if he was just sort of saying this flippantly, like, uh, you know, but he's standing there face to face with the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And yet he doesn't wait for any response. Luke gives an entire chapter, Luke 23, Mark, Mark 15, we mentioned that a moment ago, and then Matthew gives chapter 27. But it's only uh, in Matthew 27 that we're going to meet our character for today. By the way, hang on for just a second, because the, you may not have realized this, but for much uh, of history, one of the skeptics' biggest arguments against the story of Jesus was that there was no historical evidence of this man named Pilate. They, they were like, hey, listen, if somebody was as big as this guy, there should be some record of him outside of the biblical record. And they couldn't find one anywhere until 1960. And in 1960, in uh, Caesarea Philippi, they came across what has now been called Pilate's Stone. They found an inscription that says Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judah, or governor of Judah. Judah. 
And so it was the first piece of evidence that corroborated the entire story of that Pilate was a real person. By the way, that stone is dated to the first century AD um, that would have been very close to the time frame that Pilate was uh, in power. But it's only in Matthew chapter 27 that we're going to meet our character that we're going to talk about today. They enter in the middle of the discourse between Jesus and Pilate. Pilate is struggling to determine what he's going to do with Jesus. Now, it was the, the practice of the, the governor to hear a case, right? If it came to him, he was sort of like the Supreme Court, if you will. He would hear the case, and then he would rule almost immediately. It was not some sort of long deliberation process where they would go off in closed quarters and then come back out days or even weeks later to give something. No, it was sort of an immediate sort of a thing. But in the, the, the course of this interaction for Pilate, three different times, he comes out and says, Jesus is innocent. He finds no fault with him. There's no reason for him to be um, crucified or sentenced to death. In fact, what he does instead is he has Jesus flogged, right, hit 39 times, and then humiliated. He allows the Roman soldiers to put a crown of thorns over his head to adorn him with a purple robe to mock him and to make fun of him. And then he pulls him out and parades him in front of the Jews as if to say, isn't this humiliation enough? This is more punishment than I think this guy is even deserving of, but let me do this to try to appease you. It doesn't work. And then Pilate comes up with a, a, another out, there's a, a custom at the time of the Passover. And just like the, the Jews celebrated that God passed over them and that the blood of the lamb was applied and that they did not have to suffer death at the Passover, they would release one prisoner who would get to have the same story in their life, that they were passed over. They did not have to suffer for the crimes that they had committed. And so Pilate comes out and says, hey, listen, let's, let me offer you Jesus as the Passover. Let him be your Passover, the one that we won't pass judgment on. And instead of this Jesus, they hollered out, no, release Barabbas. By the way, Barabbas' first name was also Jesus. And Barabbas' crimes was that he was an insurrectionist. He caused a riot where he stood up against the Roman government and killed parts of their legion uh, of their soldiers. That's why he was to be put to death because he had done that sort of thing. And this was the very crime that Jesus was standing on trial for that he had not committed. Not only did he try to have Jesus passed over, but he sent Jesus to Herod. Now, this is not the same Herod from when Jesus was born, right? This is one of Herod's son. This is Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas ruled over all of the area of Galilee. It was one of the sections that were um, separated after Herod the Great died, and his son took over this area of Galilee. And, and Pilate sent Jesus to Herod because he's like, listen, Jesus is from the area and the region of Galilee. This is where he spent most of his time. He's really your subject, not mine. So why don't you take care of this thing? And Herod sends Jesus back with a good luck note on him. <laughs> I, I mean, not really. He doesn't really sign a note, but he, he sends him back. And he's like, hey, I don't really want to mess with this, but thanks for sending me. It seems like I can talk to him for a second. He didn't really talk to me. And, and there it was. He's now stuck with all of these things. Then Pilate finally decides what it is that he's going to do and he goes and he sits down at what is called in the book of John, Gabbatha. And Gabbatha means the stone pavement. It's sort of a mixture of Aramaic and Hebrew in this moment to sort of give an idea of what it was. There was this place of judgment that they would come and sit down and render the verdict of everything that was about to happen. Let me sort of geek out for you for just a second. Those of you who don't like when I geek out, you can just, I'll tell you when to come back. Those of you who like it, here you go, all right? In the Greek, the word for the same place is bema, B-E-M-A, bema, the bema seat. Later on, Paul uses this same idea. The bema seat is the seat of judgment. And in this moment, man is sitting judging over God. 
And Paul says there will be a day when all of us and all of this will be reversed. And Jesus will be sitting on the Bema seat. And we will be the one. God will be judging mankind, not mankind judging God. So here it is. He has sat down at the Bema seat. He's about to render his verdict. And that's where we get our text today. So in the middle of all of this commotion that we read, verse 19, says this. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him. Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. I sort of like how um, the Passion Translation tries to capture this moment. Here's what it says. It says, just then, as Pilate was proceeding over the tribunal. Now I tell you, between those two versions, which one sounds more authoritative in that moment, right? Like, hey, he just sat down at the judgment seat. He's presiding over a tribunal. I, I'm, I really like how they sort of captured this sort of moment. It sounds like there's way more important judging that's about to happen in, in this sort of a spot. But Pilate is about to deliver his verdict. In midstream, our person today interrupts everything that's about to happen. Pilate's wife sends a message in. And much like the kings of the Old Testament, right, you didn't come in front of Pilate lightly. In fact, if you know the story of Esther in the Old Testament, she was a, a queen uh, that was there, and, and her people were, the Jews were about to, to be put to death because of a, a terrible plot that was there. And she could not just come straight before the king to make her request. She came in with fear and trembling and, and much trepidation. And it, why? Because she knew she could be put to death just for troubling him with whatever it was that was going on. And it wasn't much different in this moment that Pilate still had all of this same sort of authority and yet Pilate's wife steps in to this moment to intercede on the behalf of Jesus she steps in to this moment by sending in a servant could you imagine that servant for just a second hi I have a letter from your wife I have a note from her. She didn't like pack it in his lunch for him to like open up, like, hi, honey, I love you. How's your day going? No, she sent this in. And most scholars believe that she was probably standing off to the edge of the court where only his eyes could see her. Nobody else could see her, but he could make eye contact with her. And so I imagine he gets this note, right? And like daggers are being shot over to her about everything. And he opens it up and he reads this note that says, Hey, this is a very troubling situation. I've had this incredible, awful wrestling of a dream. And I think that you should not do what it is about you're about to do. Don't crucify this man. Don't be a part of any of this thing. You need to let him go. He's innocent. He is something totally different. That's what it was. Now, some of you may be going, well, who is Pilate's wife, right? Like, what else do we know about Pilate's wife? Well, the biblical text only gives us exactly what we have read, this one verse. However, there's some tradition and some texts from our early fathers as well as some non-biblical texts, all right? Now, non-biblical, let me help you understand something about non-biblical for just a second. Here's what's very difficult about non-biblical is that they mix myth with truth, to tell a story together. And the difficult thing about that is, is trying to decipher what is truth versus what is myth. The great thing about the Bible is it's all truth, no myth. Right? But in some non-biblical text, we discover that her name was most likely Claudia Procola. Claudia Procola. One scholar connected her name to the greetings that Paul gives later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Right There's a Claudia that is mentioned. And that same commentator said that this is most likely the one and same of Pilate's wife. And he's giving greetings to her because she was in captivity awaiting the same sort of judgment that Paul was in. 
Paul's story um, was that even though he was trying to spread the gospel, he got on the wrong side of all of the Jews and the Pharisees. They wanted to see him killed. And then in the midst of that, he declared, I'm a Roman citizen. I have Roman rights. And now he had to go through Roman courts. And because of that, he used all of that to try to get himself to Rome. He's like, I want to take the gospel to Rome. That's why we wrote the book of Romans. It was sort of a letter of, hey, I'm coming to Rome. Let me help you with all the things that I believe, introduce myself about everything, but I want to come and set up a base of operations there because I want to go from you to Spain and to the ends of the earth. That was Paul's whole idea. But what happened in the course of all of that is, is that Paul was really on trial for his life. And Claudia Percola was thought to be on trial for her life in the same sort of way that Paul had been waiting as well. By the way, that same commentator who made this connection said that it was not uncommon for a high-ranking government official to be a proselyte or a convert to another religion. In fact, Nero, which if you don't know this, Nero's the one who um, basically burned down half of Rome uh, most scholars say he did it so he could rebuild it in whatever image he wanted, but he used the, the, the pretext of the Christians in order to burn it down and to begin killing them off. His second wife was a proselyte Jew. She became Jewish somewhere along, along the way and began following God. And so this was not some sort of uncommon thing that the wives would become converts to, um, to different religions. And so here it is, we have the, this person, Claudia Procola. By the way, this same person uh, in Eastern Orthodox churches and in the Coptic church is a, um, is a venerated or considered a saint. Um, she's, again, it comes from that non-biblical text of the, the Gospel of Nicodemus um, and it's one of those places where it lists the things that she did. And it says that in fact, she became a follower of Jesus even before he died on the cross. Okay, all of that's a lot of setup for my point. My point is this. A relationship with Jesus, relationship with Jesus requires action on our part. We cannot passively receive Jesus. Our society talks a lot about passivity today, right? We have passive-aggressive people. We have passive males right uh, of which to be honest as we look at this um, passage Pilate seems to be pretty passive uh, as a guy who's in authority and power right he has every chance to say that he has ruled that Jesus is innocent and that's it that that's the end of it in fact he comes out and says that three different times but instead what we see is that Pilate bows down to the pressures of the people for just a second, here's what I would like to explore. I'd like to explore what creates a passive person. What makes a passive person? I think there's a few different things that make somebody passive that we can see from Pilate's own life. Number one, past mistakes. Past mistakes. This is perhaps the largest driver of what makes somebody passive and bow down to the likes of peer pressure. See, Pilate came into the region about 26 AD, so seven, eight years prior to this moment right here. And, and Pilate came in guns a-blazing. He was going to show these Jews who was in charge. And so he came in and, and he set up some standards, some, some iconography, some pictures of, of Caesar. And he did it all the way up to leading to and around the temple. You can imagine how that made all of the Jews, the Pharisees in the region that he was in feel. And they revolted. They began tearing the flags down. In fact, Luke chapter 13 t tells the story that, um, that as they were headed to go worship and doing all of this, that Pilate began spilling their blood. He killed them. And in fact, the Pharisees were asking Jesus to weigh in on this moment, and he doesn't weigh in on, on what was happening politically. Josephus and Tacitus, some of the historians of the day, tell the story that, um, that when the, the Pharisees had revolted and were tearing everything down and, and the, the soldiers were all there, they captured them and brought them into Pilate's court. And Pilate thought what he would do is, I'm just going to intimidate them so that they'll follow me, that they'll understand that I'm the one that's in charge. And so he says to them, he says, listen, there is no compromise on this. 
We all worship Caesar. That's what we do. And so we, that's our emperor. That's who we do things to. You need to know that. That's what I'm here for. So you need to get in line and follow. And if you can't do that, then I'll just kill you. And Josephus reports that the Pharisees stuck out their necks and said, here, we'll make it easier for you. In other words, we're not backing down from what it is that we believe. In fact, if you do this, we know that we will have people that will send word back to Rome about what it is that you've done and the atrocity about what it is that you've caused, and you won't be here long. We may be dead, but you'll be gone too. And as a result, Pilate backed down. And now, instead of ruling the region, he was being ruled by the region. So here it is, this same guy has this moment, this opportunity, and yet he backs down. James Stalker, writer of the book, The Trial and Death of Jesus Christ, said, there is nothing that so frustrates good resolutions and paralyzes noble efforts as the dead weight of past sins. We feel that, right? If people know things about us, where all of a sudden we're afraid to do anything that might displease that person because we're afraid of what it is that they might say about us. Sort of like politics 101 in that sort of a moment. And so here it is, Pilate backs down in order to keep the peace. And it's sort of with this mistake in mind in this history that was haunting him that we see the text say this later on down in verse 24. It says, so when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, rather that a riot was beginning. Here's what he did. He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Pilate was passive, and he was passive because of his past sins. Listen, there's only one way that you could possibly defeat this sort of passivity, right? You have to be willing to own up to your past faults and failures. I have a coach, and he says this. He says, listen, you're, you will always pay for your mistakes. You'll always pay for your mistakes. You can either choose to pay now, or you can choose to pay later with interest. It's true. And here it was, Pilate was deferring the interest to even later a failure to face our past and all of our problems heads on will put us into a vulnerable position and it can be a root cause of passivity listen not only was it his personal mistakes that led to his passive nature in this moment but I think it was also his personal pursuits Pilate was after power right he was after popularity he was after prestige. And he thought that power and popularity and prestige would bring peace to the region. Pilate came in wanting all of these things. But here it was in this moment, right? He's faced with a situation that could literally bankrupt him. He could lose his power. He is losing his popularity. His prestige is escaping away. And peace seems intangible at this moment, unreachable. And so he becomes passive in an attempt to keep these things and to keep the peace. But what cost? Tradition suggests that Pilate was really not long for ruling after this. In fact, following this moment, there's a change in Caesar's. And when Caesar's change, those governing officials underneath them all change as well because of alliances on things. And Pilate was sent out to pasture, depending on which tradition you follow. Some say that as he got there, he killed his own self. He committed suicide. Others say that he was executed um, by the new Caesar. It doesn't really matter the picture of it all is still the same that passiveness is always a recipe for disaster right it doesn't work it doesn't work in our marriages 
Some of you men just went, whoa, he went there. It's true, right? Pilate should have listened to his wife. Some of you wives just went, yes, he should have. Some of you men just went, I'm, no, I'm done listening, Pastor Charles. I know, I'm sorry. He could have acknowledged Jesus in this moment, though, right? He comes so close. He calls Jesus the king of kings, the king of the Jews. Excuse me, not the king of kings, but the king of the Jews. In fact, he writes it on a placard and has it put above Jesus. And in fact, in this moment, right, the Jews come back to him, the Pharisees come back to him and say, hey, listen, we're killing him because he said he purported to be, he claimed to be. Could you change this to be that he claimed to be? And he said, no, listen, what I wrote, I wrote. It's done. And in that moment, he said it was done, but he refused to say that Jesus was innocent and let that be done. But come on, guys, how many of you have ever had your wives say to you um, to be more proactive in your marriage and less passive, right? We've all been there. We've all had that conversation. In fact, I watched um, the Holderness family. If you've ever watched them, their, their videos, they do some parody songs on things. And he did a parody of like 80s and 90s love songs. And he said, hey, listen, I've learned a thing or two in 17 years of marriage. He said, I want to change these to really show you how much it is that I love you on this. And the first song that he sang, he said, hey, I just want to pick up my shoes and put them away where you want me to. And his wife was right there, and she was like, yes, that's so good. Next song, he sang the parody, and the line was is that um, I'll just get out of bed at the same time as you to help with the kids. Oh, man, felt that one. It's like, right? And over and over again, it was these things that we are just, as men, we are so passive about that our, our wives want us to be active in these sort of moments. By the way, women, when you want us to be active and proactive in something, right, don't tell us how wrong we did it after we were proactive in it. We're doing our best. Applaud us along the way. Encourage us. Maybe even reward us. We work well on reward systems. Just saying. I thought there'd be some more amens on that one, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. Otherwise, what you're getting is if you just, ha that sort of piece of everything you end up with, hey, it's just passivity back in disguise. Listen, passivity doesn't work in marriage, but passivity also doesn't work with other people. Why? Because passive always folds under pressure. Passive always folds under pressure. So you're never ultimately going to make other people happy. That's the goal of the passive person. I just want to make everybody happy. And the, the, the truth of it is, is that if you're being passive, you will never make anybody happy. Everybody will be mad at you. You will make nobody happy. That's the ultimate truth of what being passive does. Finally, passivity doesn't work with God. Pilate didn't happen, or he happened into a chance encounter with Jesus. He has this moment where he gets to encounter him, and he gets to ask him some things, and he has this conversation. He says to him, hey, are you really the king of the Jews? And Jesus says to him, as clear as he possibly can, he says, listen, if my kingdom was of this world, my subjects would not have allowed for me to have been captured. They'd have been at your doorstep warring about this. If that's the kind of king that I am, that's what would have happened. But I am not a king of this world world and my subjects are under the authority of my father and the only authority that you have is what my father has given you in this moment Pilate has to wrestle with this truth about what it is that Jesus has said about who it is that he is but in this moment his wife comes in and while Pilate is passively letting all of this come through and past him on stuff she proactively steps into the moment all she has is a dream a dream that she says was very troubling hey listen i've had some crazy dreams before right and i've kept my mouth shut about what those dreams were nobody needed to know that there were purple octopuses in my dream i don't know what that meant 
right? But she comes and she's like, listen, I was so tormented. Like, what was going on in this dream that she was wrestling through and with that she's like, I cannot remain silent in this moment. I have to step in. Listen, she understood what it was going to cost her. Her proactivity could possibly cost all of the power, all of the popularity, all of the prestige, even her life. And yet, she still stepped in to that moment because that's what Jesus meant. She didn't want it. She didn't want any of those things if it meant forfeiting the very peace that she was craving, the peace of God. She had been tormented in a dream and she understood the separation between where she was at and the peace that God was offering. And so she was willing to risk everything and be proactive and do what we might call a step of faith. It didn't make sense. She didn't have all the answers, but she knew that this was what she wanted. Hey, listen, on this Palm Sunday, I want to invite you to just take a minute. I want to invite you to take a minute and, and to ask yourself in this story, who am I most like? If you're here and you're not a Jesus follower, ask yourself, am I most like the Pharisees? The ones who were just anti-Jesus. They hated him. They wanted him killed, dead, gone. And you, if you were to be honest with yourself, you're like, you know what? I'm just against the very notion of God and Jesus. I sort of doubt that if you're sitting here in this room right now. But maybe, or maybe you know somebody that that's who they are. Maybe, though, if you're honest, you're like, I'm, I'm a little bit more like Pilate. And I'm sort of just passively observing everything that's coming and listen as you passively observe it will pass you right on by because what it requires at some point is to be proactive to take a step of faith to step across the line and to say I know this may cost me something but I'm going to do it anyways and maybe you're here and you are a Jesus follower I want to invite you to do the same thing, to, to ask yourself the question about what kind of Jesus follower am I? Am I more like Pilate and I'm just passively being a Christian? I, I know that people are, are dying and, and going to hell all around me that need to know who Jesus is and, and I'm doing my best to live my life there next to them. And if they have questions, they can come ask me about why everything is so different. Not that you shouldn't be living your life differently, but that's being passive. If they know where I'm at every Sunday, I don't have to tell them where I go to church or invite them to come and be a part of my church. I can just be passive. Listen, I'm guilty of this all the time. So many moments that God lays on my heart and says, hey, listen, I want you to be proactive. I want you to take a step of faith. I want you to do something a little bit uncomfortable. I want you to get outside of your zone for me. Just, just do something that you may feel like it's going to cost you. And I'm like, well, Jesus, I mean, they know I'm a pastor. I wear my hat all the time. It says Church of Australia. And we want to be passive and yet, what Jesus has said is, no, I want you to be proactive. I want you to be proactive in following me. I want you to take a step when you go out to, to dinner to ask your server to say, hey, how could I pray for you today? We're going to pray for our meal. How could I pray for you? Hey, can I invite you to come to, to church? Hey, friend, can I share my story with you about how Jesus has changed my life? Hey, I, I'd like to invite you to come to Easter service with me next week. I'll be at the 9 a.m. I'll save a chair for you. It may be packed seating. That's great. We love that. Jesus wants us to be proactive, not forsaking love, in that moment he doesn't want us to be mean and ugly but he does want us to be proactive in sharing Jesus let me pray for us Father thank you for this morning 
for this story of a, of a wife who stepped into a moment. God, I, I love what tradition says with, about her. I don't know if it's true or not, but um, God, I, I see a woman that's there that was stepping across the line even though it would cost her maybe everything to acknowledge who Jesus was. God, I pray that we would have the same kind of faith that she had in that moment. To be willing to step across the line and say, you know what, this may cost, this may hurt, this may whatever. But I'm going to be proactive in my faith. God, I pray this next week that you'd give us opportunities to practice being proactive. To think about, am I being passive in this moment right now or could I step across the line? How could I demonstrate, how could I share with somebody about the difference in my life? God, there's lots of great people, lots of good people that are in this world. There's lots of good people, though, that are not gonna be in eternity forever with you because they don't have a relationship with your son. So help us to be able to show other people where living water is at. Father, we just give you all of the glory and the honor. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, my life now that I'm a Jesus follower it looks a lot different, I feel like. Um, my attitude has changed a lot with life. Uh, not like as anxious or depressed as I ever was. So my life now, after I became a Jesus follower... I can say I pray more than often, or more often than ever. Uh, I try to pray every single day, and if I don't get to do it in the morning, I at least just try to remember in the mm -hmm. afternoon to just talk to God, even if it's not sitting there, you know, in the table with my hands together praying. I just talk to God a little bit. Even just little things, um, like with my birth with Onyx, I feel like uh, Jesus was definitely there at that time because He really helped me through all of my contractions, and I had like a such quicker birth. Um, and I feel like that was only because of Jesus. I feel like a lot has changed in our life. Our relationship has gotten a lot better. So my piece of advice would be to really seek out a community. Like, I really feel like the community group really helped me um, get to know the Word of God more and get to really have, like, more of, like, a family connection because um, we're definitely missing that. So <laughs> I think community group um, or any kind of like small group that you can get into would be a great thing to start even if you are not fully like at the whole Jesus follower level you're just beginning a group would be amazing a good piece of advice is is no matter how much you feel like you're alone you're never alone because you always have Jesus to talk to or how empty you feel inside you're not empty somebody loves you somebody loves you very deeply and they might not be around you, but Jesus is always there when you need him.